Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. It's August 23rd, 2014, and this is episode 14. The theme for today is taking stock. So I have a few announcements to make before we get started, and uh, then I'm going to mainly talk today about, well, I'll do some announcements, talk about what I've been working on, and then kind of the, the main thing I want to talk about is that I just re-cataloged my whole stash. <laughs> have you been meaning to do this and not having, and you haven't done it? Let me tell you, it is just as tedious and just as horrifying, but just as good as you think it will be. <laughs> Come back from the trenches telling you. That's how it is. So I want to talk about that and why I did it and what I discovered from doing it and just kind of show you some of the stuff that I found in the bowels of my stash. And uh, the technique video today will actually be along the same lines. And I'm specifically going to talk about uh, how how to go about recording exactly how much yarn you have. So, you know, like if you've used some of a skein, how do you figure out how much you have left? This may be something that some of you do all the time, but, you know, I've learned that lots of stuff that I do all the time is stuff that many of you have never done before. So, and maybe you do it differently. So I'll just show you how I do it. So let's get started. First things first, I have uh, how to get in touch with me. I have now officially changed my name on Ravelry to Dark Matter Knits. So I'm Dark Matter Knits now everywhere. I'm Dark Matter Knits on Ravelry. I have a page on Facebook. I'm Dark Matter Knits on Instagram. And um, I have a Pinterest page where I'm Dark Matter Knits. So you and Twitter. So you can find me on all the sort of major social media as Dark Matter Knits. Done. <laughs> I've been Elizabeth GM pretty much ever since Ravelry got started because I just thought, well, that'll always be me, but Dark Matter Knits is pretty much now always me too. And I, it was just weird to have one thing that was not consistent with the rest of my presence online as a knitter. Um, I also wanted to say that I'm really thankful to the many of you who, after the last episode, wrote in to talk about what kinds of errors you're willing to put up with in classes and in hand dyed yarn and in patterns. There was a, there's been a really interesting discussion on the group about, you know, just how much human error we're willing to put up with before it really starts to set our teeth on edge. And it pretty much, I mean, although it, I found it it deepened my understanding of the issue and I was I really enjoyed reading the comments. I was left feeling pretty much the same way that teaching a class, if we just focus on that for a moment, teaching a class is really a delicate balancing act between uh, moving people along quickly through the material and having some empathy for the people who are struggling to keep up. That's pretty much what all teaching is about, isn't it? I mean, it's not just knitting that's pretty much one of the major issues in teaching, period. Um, I am also now seeking input. I mean, this this is one of the things that I am interested in hearing from you about this week. I'm thinking about starting to do some product reviews. I've, I've done one so far, and um, I don't want to do them all the time necessarily. I mean, I wouldn't mind doing them once per episode, but I don't want them to take over the content of the episode. I would keep them fairly short. Uh, I've asked on various social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, whether people are interested in having product reviews on the podcast. And so far, the resounding answer is yes. In fact, the unanimous answer so far has been yes. Uh, and quite a few of you have responded so far. But I really would be interested in hearing from those of you who are somewhat more uh, just leery, I guess, of, of reviews, um, whether you would just outright don't want them or if you would like to see them, but in a particular way. So one of the pieces of feedback I've heard so far is that, uh, some of you would really like to see reviews, but you don't necessarily want to see a review of something that has been reviewed in multiple other podcasts, which makes perfect sense to me. And, uh, you know, honestly, I was sort of already there with that. I think what I'm 
what I'm kind of leaning towards right now is is focusing on specific types of products because I I like there are certain kinds of things that I like to design and I like to knit and I think I want to focus on those kinds of things so for example I'd like to focus on stuff that involves unusual construction so books or patterns that uh, involve unusual construction. So, you know, say a, a sock design that has a new heel or a sweater that is worked from side to side or has a new type of uh, sleeve shaping or, you know, anything like that. I like those kinds of things. I like, uh, I, I design a lot for and knit a lot for men and boys. So any kind of yarns that have a palette that is suitable for men and boys, and I have a pretty liberal interpretation of what that means. Um, lots of men and boys like colors besides gray and navy blue. I'm all right. <laughs> so I'm not just talking about that, but I would really be interested in reviewing, uh, you know, or, or products that male knitters would be interested in. So I know that's a, those are fairly specific niches, but I think that might uh, both kind of help me stay true to what I do and also, um, uh, you know, help me avoid reviewing the, su the stuff that everybody else is reviewing. So l give me your feedback about that. I'd be really interested to hear what kinds of, you know, hesitations or what kinds of limits you would want to see on product reviews on this podcast. Um, and of course, you know, I'll, I'll welcome giveaways are always welcome, right? <laughs> If, you know, anybody who wants to send me stuff for review wants to do giveaways, I think we can all agree that would be fine, right? <laughs> um, I also want to, speaking of giveaways, I want to remind you that the uh, my, my first knitting book, Kung Fu Knits, is coming out September 15th. And the, uh, the giveaway, the pre-launch giveaway contest is still going on until September 12th. And uh, actually... One of the prizes just showed up literally before I started recording. The I was about to hit record and the mailman knocked. Um, he's out there dying of heat exhaustion, by the way. It's like 103 degrees outside. Poor man. Um, but these, I got the stitch markers in the mail. They're so cute. Oh, my God. I'm not really normally into stitch markers. Um, I tend to really like those utilitarian, um, the ones that kind of look like the little plastic... Uh, safety pins. Why was that so hard? Uh, but these are really cute. So check these out. Because <laughs> it's Kung Fu Knits, right? Ninjas! They're, um, let me give you a sense of scale. They're like, um, they're about half an inch tall. So, and they look like they would fit just about any size needle up to say about a, a 10 or an 11, 10 and a half or 11. Uh, I took these out because the the seller, who's Bead Passion on Etsy, and I'll I'll put a link to her in the show notes. Um, she's based in the Philippines, incidentally. It just took a while to get here. That's why I was thinking of it. Um, but she enclosed. Uh, she, she I told her I was going to be giving them away on the uh, to people who were interested in my book, and um, and she she sent me a little package for myself. So I opened the package for me so you wouldn't have to hear all the crinkling. But there is another package for a lucky winner of the pre-launch giveaway. And each uh, each package has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five stitch markers in it. So enough for really just about any project short of a giant shawl. Really, really cute. Um, so the giveaway, just to remind you briefly, oh, sorry, before I, before I go on, let me just show you. Her packaging is really cute. She enclosed some nail stickers. That is so not me, but it is so sweet that she put them in there. I think I'm just going to send them to whoever wins these because that's pretty adorable. Um, and just nobody in my house will wear them. There's just nobody girly in this house, including me. Um, but look, she put a, she put them in a little package so cute and the woman's really nice uh like i said she's based in or she lives in the philippines and so the the package took a while to get here i think it took about a month but um she's very clear about that on the on her site and um you know i think i was certainly willing to wait 
they were well worth the wait. So the giveaway, the way it works is that, and I've got all the details on my blog, by the way, at darkmetternits.com. Um, but basically, you post a picture, your favorite picture of a kid wearing something that you knitted or crocheted. And uh, it can be the kid, I mean, some of the funniest ones have been of kids like screaming their guts out. <laughs> You've got to, oh my God, you've got to go take a look at the Ravelry thread. It is so funny. I mean, there are some really cute ones and there are some that are just hilarious. Uh, but just post your favorite picture of a kid wearing something that you knitted or crocheted. It doesn't have to be your kid. The, if it is your kid, the kid can be grown up. That's fine. Uh, you know, I've given you, giving you a lot of latitude here. But you can post it on my Ravelry group, which is Dark Matter Knits. Uh, you can post it to my Dark Matter Knits Facebook page, or you can post it to Pinterest, Twitter, or Instagram with the hashtag Kung Fu Knits. And what I'm going to do is on September, sorry, it closes September 11th, not September 12th. So on September 12th, I'm going to, I'm putting all of these names in a spreadsheet and I'm going to draw winners uh, out of those people who have done this. So you can, you can post once per social medium. So you can post once on Ravelry, once on Facebook, once on Instagram, etc. Um, and the prizes, I've, I've talked about the prizes in the previous episode, it's basically, uh, the same yarn that I used for Kung Fu Knits, uh, a printed copy of the book signed by me and the illustrator, because it's got a comic book portion of it, uh, some digital copies of the book, these stitch markers that I just showed you, and this adorable ninja project bag that I showed on a previous, I think it was on the last episode. So some really good, some really good stuff. I was so, I was so thrilled to find some martial arts themed stuff um, for knitters. I didn't, I wasn't sure I would be able to, but of course, of course it's available. <laughs> Isn't everything? So I think... Oh, no, so I have one more thing to tell you about that just kind of doesn't fit in anywhere else. But, uh, and I'm going to embarrass him because I think he watches the podcast. Um, but I got a, uh, I got a phone call this week, a G-chat phone call from one of my former students. Um, I used to teach college students. And, um, and he's taken up knitting. And the way he tells me is, <laughs> he's like, he wants to chat on, on G-chat. And then he like lifts up. He's got these two straight bamboo, or no, not, they were aluminum, two aluminum needles. He lifts them up and is like, look, and he's making a prayer shawl for his mom. Man, so cool. And he's not exactly the last person I would have expected to pick up knitting, but he was definitely on that side of the balance. <laughs> I was really surprised. But you know, when I thought about it, it wasn't really that shocking, actually. And, um, and so cool. I mean, I just love, I love sharing knitting with my friends. And it's just so fun when somebody that you think might never pick it up does and is really enjoying it. So that was really exciting. Hi, Chris. <laughs> okay, so that's the announcements for this week. Um, let me show you a little bit about what I've been knitting. I don't have any spinning. Uh, I'm kind, I'm an intermittent spinner, as you have no doubt surmised if you have been watching this for a while. Uh, knitting, I have been doing a, largely because I did this stash um, re-evaluation. I've been knitting a lot of, I've been very quickly knitting a lot of things. <laughs> like, oh, I gotta get rid of it. it's yarn. So I found in the process of going through my uh, stash, this, um, this really cool, I think I showed it last week. It was, it's this, uh, it looked like a flying saucer. It was a disc that had, um, it's designed for knitting two socks at once. And, um, and it's made by Schopenvola. It's, uh, Fliegende Untertasse, which means, uh, flying saucer. And the cool thing was that the, um, it was a reel that had two strands that came off at once and they were dyed the same way so that the socks would match. So here is what they look like. I made them for my son who is 10 but has giant monkey feet. He has the same size feet I do. And I am not a small person. 
so the the era of giant socks has begun or continued or expanded or something but i really like how these came out they're super fun um you know they're obviously a kind of self-striping sort of deal and it's so weird and even on the packaging it did this i thought maybe it was just some strange change in my gauge but it wasn't um you know up here i think i did 60 stitches on a size one i tend to fit fa knit fairly loosely so knit them on a size one 60 stitches up here because he's you know he's like he's 10 he's got little pencil stick legs and um and then by the time i got down here i went back down to 60 stitches again but it had a completely different uh the way that the the colors lined up are completely different down here which i just thought was so interesting and the fact that it exactly matched what happened on the packaging was even weirder but i just did uh i didn't really follow a pattern i've knit enough socks that i just started at the top uh did a, a standard you know slip stitch heel and gus picked up stitches for the gusset and did you know kind of the standard toe except i worked the decreases uh two stitches in from the edge instead of one like many patterns recommend because it gives you more room here which i think it just kind of makes it a little nicer for the uh for the toes he loves them they uh they already look worn because they have been may i remind you that i live in texas it is 100 degrees out every day right now but by god <laughs> he was gonna wear them to school his um i actually made a pair of matching fingerless mitts to go with them because i i was going to be damned if i was going to put remaining yarn back into the stash after doing that recataloging so i made him some matching mitts and used up every last bit of that yarn <laughs> He wore those too and his justification he said was that his um i guess his science teacher who is also his homeroom teacher uh keeps her room very cold it's like well he thinks it's cold it's 72 degrees which you know to somebody born in austin i guess is like freezing um so he was like i'll just wear them while i take my test <laughs> so you know he's like oliver sitting over there with his little uh fingerless mitts on in Texas summer. Hilarious. So I finished those. I um, I also finished a hat, which I'm going to show you a little later because it also has to do with the whole stash thing. Sorry about the light. It's, it's kind of late afternoon here. And so my phone is trying to figure out whether it's light or dark in here. It's a little both phone. All right, I'm going to stop turning so it stops doing that. Uh, I also have been working on, I'm about halfway through another once I did mitts for for my son, my husband was like, ooh, I'm not sure I would like a pair of those. So he doesn't talk like that, by the way. <laughs> he doesn't sound like Homer Simpson. Um, but he wanted a pair. So I, I pulled out a, this is some leftover. Ay, ay, ay. I completely forgot to look up what this yarn, what, hang on. I had looked up everything before I started, except apparently this. So this pattern, I finished one of the mitts, obviously. This pattern is the Don't Skid Honey mitts by uh, Justina, shoot, Justina Lorkowska. And she's put it up as a, a free Ravelry, Ravelry download, which is very nice. And uh, I liked it because it had a little bit of a stitch pattern. It has this sort of traveling slip stitch. And... Uh, and has you know this nice twisted rib um she actually has fingers on hers but i just i just wanted to do a a regular top for these um yeah i sort of stopped following the instructions from from here up but they're nicely designed mitts and i'm done with the first and a pretty good way into the second so those should be done by by next week um and I also have swatched for a sweater I've been meaning to make for a long time. This is a, uh, what is this yarn? Barocco Jasper, which I believe they still make. My mom gave this to me for Christmas. I'm not even kidding, like 12 years ago. 
See, when y'all say, this is deep stash, I got this like five years ago. I'm thinking, I have yarn in my stash that I've had for 20 years. <laughs> so yeah, it's time to get this. I have a sweater's worth of Barocco Jasper in, this real, in colors that thankfully I still really, really like. In fact, I like them more now than I did when I first got them. So, and you can kind of see the full range of, of colors here. It's, um, it's got some kind of steel blue, a khaki color, brown, and I love that pop of orange in there. It's one of my favorite colors. Here's what it looks like in the skein. Really pretty yarn. It almost looks, it looks hand dyed, but it's not. And it's Barocco Jasper. I'm sure it's not that price anymore. Uh, the pattern I am making with it is also a fairly, it's a pattern that's been out for a while, since 2010. It's this. And you would think that's the yarn that I have, because by golly, it sure does look like it. Uh, but it's not. That is Liberty Wool by Classic Elite. In fact, this is a pattern booklet. Oh, here, let me show you the back. Isn't that cute? And as you can probably tell, it's made side to side. Uh, so this is a booklet that Classic Elite Yarns put out uh, for Liberty Wool yarns. And it's got some really beautiful patterns in it. I love that one on the cover. I'm thinking about making that one too. Um, some really nice ones for people who are kind of uh, curvy, like I am. Really cute scarf. The sweater that I'm making, it's called Elizabeth, appropriately enough. A sweet sweater for kids, a beret. I don't know why I suddenly did that in a French accent. An entrelock, I think that's entrelock scarf. Might just be mitered squares. I haven't looked at the uh, instructions for it. And that's it. So uh, yeah, it's a really good book. It's been out since 2010, but it's still available from Classic Elite, so you can you can still get it. The only trick with this is that uh, Jasper is definitely an Aran weight and uh, Liberty Wool is a worsted. So the gauge is completely different. So I'm going to have to redo the numbers to get Elizabeth to work. But I, I can, <laughs> famous last words, but I think I can swing it. So that's kind of coming up. I've swatched for it, but I need to, to block the swatch and... Uh, you know, and then re redo the numbers. Um, I've also been doing a little bit of swatch knitting with some yarns for a collection that I'm doing with a much loved dyer. I'm really excited about it. I will tell you more as I can, but it will be a project over the next year or so. All right, I have one more thing to tell you about before we get into uh, taking stock of stash. And this is a, a book that I picked up this week. I actually originally checked it out of the library, and I liked it so much that I went and bought it to keep in my collection. It's called Vintage Design Workshop, Knitting Techniques for Modern Style. And it's by Geraldine Warner, who is uh, based in the UK, I believe. Yes, yeah, she's a, a British designer. And... Um, it is a brilliant book. It's from Interweave, and it came out in 2013, so it's pretty recent. Uh, I So here's the basic idea behind the book is that uh, she wants to show you how to take vintage patterns, particularly from the 30, 1930s to the 1960s. Um, and after that point, she says, you know, the directions start to get more modern, so you don't really need to adapt them. But how to adapt these earlier... 20th century patterns for modern yarns and, you know, kind of modern ways of following instructions. Like the, the, the patterns are, were written very differently back then. So, um, and also how to resize them because uh, a lot of the sweater patterns, particularly from that period, don't, don't really have a range of sizes that would work for, uh, for many people now. So it's just a, but so I, I have some vintage patterns, and so I, I picked it up for that reason. I thought, oh, well, this will be good for, you know, kind of figuring out how to, to knit some of these things. One of my friends 
gifted me a bunch of really cool vintage patterns a while ago. Uh, but then I realized as I was looking through this book that it is just a gold mine for knitting designers and for people who like to do a lot of adjustment to existing patterns because the whole book is, um, here's the table of contents. She talks about uh, substituting yarns. So, you know, the, there were different, the yarns were called different things than how to recognize how to substitute, uh, how to adjust vintage sizes, um, how to shape your garment so that, you know, maybe, like she points out that pant, the waists on pants um, and skirts used to be a lot higher. Um, now the fashion is to wear them below the waist. And so, you, for example, you may need to lengthen your sweater in order to keep it from exposing your, <laughs> your stomach, for example. Um, how to put in darts, uh, how to put in cuffs and pleats. And I mean, it's so, and she, she talks about all kinds of things like how to shorten and lengthen sleeves, um, how to, let me see if I can find a good example of just how brilliant this book is. Um, she even tells you how to recalculate a set in sleeve, which that in and of itself, when I got to that page, I was like, I'm buying this book. Um, because it was the best explanation of how to shape a set in sleeve that I have ever seen. Very clear. Uh, she makes it as simple as it is possible to make it. Uh, this is just brilliant. So yeah, excellent book. Even if you're not that into vintage patterns, if you're into adjusting or designing sweater patterns, must have right here. Um, okay, so taking stock of the stash, my sort of main thing for today. I don't know what, I, I've actually been meaning to do this for a while, haven't we all? Uh, I don't know why suddenly it was time to do it, but it just was. So I started going through, I realized that really for maybe a year, I haven't really been keeping up with recording my stash and what's been kind of going in and out of it for a long time on Ravelry. So I decided to get it all out and see, you know, what have I added? What have I knit with? What do I still have some of, but I've used a little bit of, you know, like let's just get it all recorded, photographed, etc. cetera. Um, and it, so it's just really interesting some of the kinds of things that I learned going through it because I, I have a fair amount of yarn. I mean, those um, fairly large plastic tubs that a lot of people keep their yarn in, I don't have four of them, but I could fill four of them. I have three and the rest of the yarn is kind of scattered here and there. So it's, it's a stash. It's not, I mean, given that I've been knitting for 30 years, I could probably have done a lot worse. But um, yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of stuff. But the funny thing is, and you've probably discovered this if you've ever gone through and cataloged your stash or just gone through and tried to find, you know, a specific something is that there are some gaps. You know, I've got, there are some things that you would think I have that I just really don't. So one of them is that I don't really have much sport weight. And I think from hearing other people talk and kind of looking around at what's available. Part of it is that sport weight just isn't really that popular a weight anymore. I'm not really quite sure why. Uh, I have a fair amount of, of uh, Bugga, which is a yarn that both cephalopod yarns and, um, oh my goodness, Verdant Griffin, uh, they both dye it. And I love, that's a wonderful sport weight. And I have a little bit of Knit Picks, uh, Wool of the Andes sport. But beyond that, I don't really, I don't really have any. And it's a weight I really, really like because they make quick socks. Uh, in this climate, it's a really practical weight. If you want to make a lightweight sweater, it's a wonderful way to do it without, you know, having to quite slog all the way through a fingering weight uh, pattern. 
So that was kind of interesting. And um, I don't really have that much air and weight either, which is not quite as necessary, like I say, in this climate. But um, but yeah, just still kind of interesting that that wasn't there. I have like more bulky than air and weight. Don't know why. Um, I have, this really surprised me. I have very little hand dyed sock yarn. What? <laughs> How is this true of anyone who knits? I mean, that's like half of most people's stash, isn't it? So strange. I, you know, it may be that up until recently, I, uh, I kind of stopped knitting socks for a while. I knit a lot of socks for a while, but that was kind of before the big hand-dyed sock boom started. And um, and I don't. And up until recently, I didn't knit that many shawls. So maybe I just wasn't really looking for it, or maybe I just thought because everybody else has too much hand-dyed sock yarn, I did too. <laughs> I don't know. It's just really funny. I, I don't think I have a single... No, that's not true. I do have one skein of hand-dyed sock yarn that my friend Heidi gave me. And that's it. I'm pretty sure that's it. And I have it all... Oh gosh, no, that's not true. I have one from Little Monkey Stitch and Spin too. But, um... Oh, and I have one from Highland Handmaids. <laughs> okay, well I have more than one. But, uh... But yeah, it all is in here. And I think I think some like a comforter came in here originally. I love using those kinds of bags. And uh yeah, I've got all my sock yarn in here including some scraps. And in fact, that's kind of what I did with all of my my stash was I tried to take all the oddballs and sort them by weight. So, I have a bag that has all my DK scraps in it. And um so, for instance, out of that bag, I made this hat. I'll explain the whole in a minute. Uh, I had a bunch of, um, no, it wasn't the DK bag. It was the worsted and Aaron weight bag. I had a bunch of leftover uh, Rios and whatever their Aaron weight washable yarn is, Malabrigo's. Um, I had a bunch, and they all kind of coordinated together, so I made my son a hat. Just a, you know, not following a pattern, just a, a ribbed hat. And I thought it would be cool because he has really long hair. It's almost as long as mine. And he wears it in a ponytail. That'd be cool to make him a ponytail hat, right? So he can stick it out of the back without having to, you know, smash it. And um, so I, I, I told him my idea. He's like, oh, it's so cool. And his favorite color is purple. So, you know, he's like, oh, those are really nice. And uh, he's like, oh, it's really soft as I'm making it. Oh, it's just going to be really great. And I showed him the hole, and I was like, look, you're going to be able to put your ponytail through here. He's like, that's so cool. And uh, got to the end of it, he put it on, and he came out of the bathroom, and he's like, yeah, it's not really my style. Dude, this is, this is what it is to knit for boys. Seriously? Oh, my God. Boys of a certain age, I should say. They just fickle. Fickle. But I thought all the way along that this might happen. And so uh, he has the same size head I do. And I thought, hey, I got long hair too. I'll just wear it. So more for me, sucko. So that. Um, I realized in sorting my stash that I had lots of odds and ends and not a lot of uh, not a lot of yarn that could be made that could be used to make large projects. I don't have very many sweater quantities. I don't have very many uh, groups of skeins that could be put together into a larger shawl. Or uh, you know, I have lots. I have the ability to make so many hats, which is good because I like making hats. But uh, yeah, just really odd assortments of things. But like you know, a, a ball that's kind of just enough that it's just too much to throw away. So I got to figure out some, some scrappy projects to do to use up some of this stuff. Um, and I also wanted to explain 
the same. Well, so for example, in the department of what do I do with this? I think I can figure out what to do with this, but this is kind of a good example. I've got tons of leftover Barocco, what is this yarn called? Remix. I love Barocco Remix. I designed a sweater with this. And uh, it's a wonderful recycled yarn. It has no wool in it. So if you're allergic to wool, let me make sure that's correct before I... Yes, that's right. It's it's a crazy combination of nylon, cotton, acrylic, silk, and linen, which when you hear it, you might think, that sounds nasty, but it's not. It's really, really nice. It's like you're knitting with your favorite cotton t-shirt. Very soft, wears extremely well, and it's very affordable. So I have like, I don't know, I, well, my stash knows, but I've got enough of this probably to make a sweater, but it's all in different colors, right? I mean, I've got the gray and one, two different greens and this navy blue, and they all look fine together. I just, you know, kind of figure out something to do with it. And, um, and then I keep all my stuff. I had to kind of get out all the Ziploc, get out a couple of boxes of Ziploc bags to make sure everything was all sealed up because we don't really have moths here, but we have carpet beetles. Carpet beetles! Oh my god, carpet beetles. They get into my yarn and they munch on it. They lay their eggs in my yarn. And then you find these little larvae. I hate them. So I keep everything in plastic bags. And that pretty much controls the problem. Um how I did it. So here's what I did. I got everything out. I had Ravelry open on my computer to see, okay, do I already have this in my stash? Is it an accurate record of what I actually have? I would weigh my yarn, make sure that, you know, what I have there is actually what I've still got, you know, that I didn't use up some bits of it on something else. And I'll explain that whole weight thing in a moment. Um, if it wasn't in my stash, I took a photograph of it with my phone. I have uh, the Flickr app downloaded on my phone. So I just op took the picture directly from Flickr, uh, added it to an album called Stash. And then when you go into your Stash page on Ravelry, um, you can, there's a Flickr importer that just pulls photos directly out of whatever album you tell it to look in. So that was, that went pretty quickly. And they, if you look down, when you're adding stash, if you look down at the bottom of the page, they had these nice features. They've had them for a while now where uh, you put in all the information and then you say, you can say, save this and go to photos. So you're just immediately going right to the next step. Um, and once you've added the photos, you can say, you know, save this and add a new colorway. So you get the same yarn, uh, it just plops all that information in and then you just tell it what colorway this is and plop that photo in. So you can really kind of move along through this stuff. Um, and yeah, I'll explain the, the weight thing in a moment, but um, that's basically how I did it. So let me just go ahead and transition into the technique thing. Um, or the, the technique segment to explain how I go about uh, keeping track of my stash and measuring it. So um, one of the things to bear in mind is that if you faithfully keep track of your, so here, here's, here's the general problem, right? Is that you've got all this yarn and even if you're doing a pretty good job of keeping track of new yarn that you're putting in. Um, how do you keep track of how much yarn you're using? How much is going out? So one thing to, to realize is that if you faithfully keep track of your projects, of what you're actually knitting, Ravelry automatically deletes that yarn from your stash. So let's say you make a shawl and you use up a uh, a skein and a half of a lace weight yarn. You still got that half skein left, 
but you make a project page for the shawl and you say, I used a skein and a half of this yarn for my stash, like you actually draw it out of your stash. Ravelry will, on your stash page, say that now you only have a half a skein left. It automatically does that when you, on your project page, tell it how much yarn you used from your stash. So that's that's one tip is just to, if you want to keep careful record of what is going out of your stash into projects, keep up with your projects pages. I don't always tend to do that quite as faithfully. Like if I'm just doing really simple stuff, I don't tend to, to record it. So I end up, my stash looks like it has more yarn in it than it actually does because I'm not using more of it than it seems. So here's how to deal with that problem if you're not accurately keeping up with your projects. What I do is I go ahead and I'm trying to find a, uh, a ball to do this with because that was the one thing that I forgot to do. I'll get it out of this fingering weight bag that I showed you earlier. Oh my gosh, I've got everything so baggied that I can't. <laughs> it's hard to keep it to get it out again okay so ugh, it's falling everywhere all right so here's a partial ball of i believe this is that lorna's laces uh soulmate so here's what i do i have a kitchen scale it's not an expensive one you can get them for like 10 or 15 dollars at any uh in the u.s you would get them at a, a uh, like a kitchen store or a bathroom bed bath and beyond kind of store um I imagine Ikea probably carries something like this. The key thing is that you want it to have the ability to measure in grams and ounces because grams is a more accurate measurement. You want to make sure it has grams on it. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and basically all you do is you just turn it on, to find out how much it weighs in grams, and then you compare it against the ball band. So I know this is a partial ball. It's not a full skein of sock yarn. I put it on the, the scale once I turn it on. And it's, it's telling me that there, there are 25 grams in this ball, which is convenient because that's going to be a lot easier to calculate. All right, now I don't have the ball band anymore, but I could look it up on Ravelry what Soulmate had in it. But let's say that it was a 100 gram uh, skein of sock yarn, which is pretty standard for fingering weight skeins. So here's how you calculate how much you have left. There are two ways to go about it. One of them is to um, just to say to yourself, all right, if it's, uh, if I have 25 grams left, all I need to do is go on, go on Ravelry, go into my stash, edit that entry and it net, where it says one, put in 0.25. It was 100 grams, now it's 0.25. Because it's, it was 100 grams, now it's 25. That's 25%, right? Um, so you could just figure out what percentage it is. And then Ravelry will calculate for you what that means in yards. Um, or you can figure that out yourself by doing the following thing. And I've, I'll put this calculation in the show notes too, in case this just kind of goes. But here's how you would do it. You would, um, wait, let me make sure I get this exactly right. So I, I have a tendency to get tongue tied when I do, when I talk about math out loud. Okay, so you take the skeins original yardage. Let's say just for the sake of simplicity, that it was 200 yards. Divide it by the original weight in grams. So 100 grams in this case. So 200 divided by 100, that's two. Then multiply that by the remaining weight in grams, what you've actually got here. Just weighed it, I found out it was 25 grams. So I take that two, multiply it by 25, and I get 50. This is 50 yards. So now I know I've got 50 yards of this sock yarn and I can go into, I can go into Ravelry and look up what kinds of projects there are. If you go to the advanced 
pattern page, pattern search page, not the not the main pattern search page, but the advanced one. Look for the little link underneath the search bar. Um, on the advanced pattern search page, I can go in and say, all right, what can I make fingering weight yarn zero to 50 yards? And up will pop scads of things, probably mostly toys, maybe some baby socks, for example. So that's how you do it. And um, it's really great to be able to have all that information at your disposal because, like I say, you can do, you can really figure out using the tools on Ravelry, you can really figure out how to use up all that leftover yarn um, once you actually know what you've got. <laughs> so um, I believe, I believe that is it for this week. Thank you all for tuning in, and I will I will see you in a couple of weeks. And um, by that time, my book will be really close to coming out. And it will be, by then. Oh, this is what I forgot to tell you. Oh my gosh, um, the pre-orders for my book will go up on Monday. So on at CooperativePress.com and on Ravelry, you will be able to pre-order my book this Monday. Uh, and it comes out September 15th. So, all right, that's really it. And I will see you in a couple of weeks.